Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with this thing, the Tenstedt Mahler Cycle. You know, I've done my ultimate Mahler cycles, and I've done lots of reviews of the individual Mahler symphonies and my ideal Mahler and whatnot, but I thought it would be fun to actually go through some of the, some of the boxes, because they're still around. They're actually still around. I mean, this one, as you can see, has been Warnerized. It doesn't say EMI. It's been Warnerized. So, so this is really rather cool. And actually, there's a lot in here, um, the, more than that was in that little EMI brown ugly box thing. So we, let's let's go through it. Um, this is a particularly valuable box, I think, and we'll talk about it. Now, this is with the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Tenstedt was a very very inspirational conductor, and conduct a very inspirational conductor. There we go. And he could blow hot and cold, let us say. He really could. I mean, in fact, the greatest Tenstep performance I ever saw, he didn't show up for. He was supposed to do Mahler 4 in New York, but he canceled, as he often did toward the end of his life because he was ill. And Leonard Bernstein stepped in and did a couple performances of Mahler 2. Whoa, yay, baby, with Crystal Ludwig and Barbara Hendricks. And oh, my goodness. That was fun. Thank you, Klaus Tenstedt. Anyway, he, he did do some extraordinary Mahler performances. His studio recordings are not always as exciting and successful as his live ones. So let's just see what's in here, and we'll take it from there. First, number one. Well, yes, of course, it begins with number one, doesn't it? Um, his number one is a good performance, but it was not all that well recorded on vinyl. I remember quite vividly listening to a review of it on WQXR's first hearing, where they had the same problem I did, which was that you could barely hear the, the initial harmonic in the strings. It was just dying in the grooves and surface noise and whatnot. It's not brilliantly recorded. It's a little bit of a droopy performance, frankly. But it's not bad. It's nice. It's it's okay. Number two, he always did a great number two. Tenstedt Mahler two was like his signature work. It was inspirational. It was transcendental. It had everything you want. His studio recording is excellent, and it was well recorded. But he did do it live a couple times on the LPO's own label, and everybody says those are better. And you know, for once, everybody's kind of right. You know, the live ones, they're extraordinary. Even with the little mistakes and things here and there, they, they especially, I mean, there's two of them, and one of them is better than the other. But the bottom line is that Mahler II with Tenstedt was a thing. And you really have to hear it. Because, you know, nowadays, everyone's churning this stuff out and tossing it off. There's no sense of occasion, no sense of it being a major event. And Mahler II should always be a major event. And here it is. Now, number three is quite different. You would think he would sort of you know, hit the same notes that he does in number two, but he doesn't. It's a much more small-scale conception of the work. It's not bad by any, any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, the finale, for example, is 20 minutes and a little bit long. The tempos tend to be on the swift side. The London Philharmonic is not the most impactful Mahler orchestra out there. You know, they, don't have, they never had any bass. You know, they're, they're, British orchestras generally don't have much bass, but the London Phil particularly had very little bass. And and the performance itself is somewhat lightweight. Uh, it just needs to have more power in the first movement and more, and more intensity in the finale. And the stuff in the middle is very nicely done for the most part. And so it's good, but not as fabulous as the second. Now, his Mahler four. Uh, this one with, with Lucia Pop Soprano was absolutely ruined by just crappy sound. It was an early digital recording, one of EMI's earliest digital recordings, and it just sounded lousy, and it still does, quite frankly. I think it, it's, a, it's, it's an attractive performance, but I saw him do it live. They televised some performances and whatnot. They were so much more effective. It's just not special. Number five is pretty good. Number five really is pretty good. This was an analog recording. It's 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 a little bit a little bit dense and dark and kind of congested in some ways. The scherzo is 18 minutes long. <whistles> yeah, he's not kidding, is he? Um, but it's a good performance. It's really just it's it's you know a little bit slow, but he doesn't blow it. You know how many people blow Mahler five? I mean, they just can't get it get it in their brains. He 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 knows it. And he plays it well. And I, I like this Mahler 5. I enjoy the performance. Um, number number 6, uh, I think, it was always a bit of a mess. 
It really is. I, you know, it, it, he did. We'll see in a moment that he makes up for it. But it's it's just it's just it's nothing. I mean, it's Mahler six. It's supposed to be like unbelievable and and and, and knock your socks off kind of Mahler six. But it doesn't it doesn't have any outstanding moments and it doesn't have any any, you know, completely awful, ridiculous moments. It's just it's just blah. You know, it's blah. Number seven is also blah. I, I don't understand that one either. That was another bad digital recording. It just sounded lousy. And the performance itself, I, I don't think he really had the feeling for it. You know, seven is not the kind of thing that's going to get a conductor, an inspirational conductor like Tenstedt, really going. You know, with his, his pulse pounding. You don't feel his pulse pounding in that because it's not that kind of a work. It's a cooler work emotionally. It's a quirky, strange work. And Tenstedt was better with the, you know, hardcore, emotional, passionate, let it all hang out Mahler. As we hear in this performance of the eighth. Now, this eighth is widely neglected by people. And when it came out, I remember everyone was talking about how, well, he uses smaller forces than usual, like only four or five hundred people instead of the usual 12 billion people or whatever. I don't think that's the point at all. The chorus sounds fine. The soloists are fine. And it's a beautiful performance. It's fresh. It's lively. Okay, if it's not as grandiose as some of the other ones out there, it's fine with me, especially because the second part is really, really well done. It has incredible freshness. It has that that Desknobben Wunderhorn folk-like feel. It keeps moving beautifully. It's a wonderful conception of the work. I, I don't understand why it doesn't get more attention than it than it, it has hitherto. And, you know, he did do Das Lied von der Erde with Agnes Balza and Klaus Koenig. It's also a very good Das Lied von der Erde, one that no one ever paid attention to, ever, ever. I don't understand that either. I really don't. Maybe because the singers were not like the most famous singers, but... Oh, heavens, they sing perfectly well, and the conducting is excellent. It's a very fine Das Lied, definitely worth hearing, and, and a real sleeper. You know, nobody nobody knows that it was under there, so, I mean, under the, the underbelly of his Mahler cycle. And then there's the ninth. Yes, good old Mahler nine. Again, um, it's a good Mahler nine. It's not a great Mahler nine. It could have... Uh, you wanted to hear him do it live. That's all I can say. I think the studio circumstances tended to undermine some of the intensity that he would have brought to the work. I mean, the playing is a little bit, a little bit shaky here and there, especially in the first movement, and and it just lacks a certain intensity. But it is an analog recording, and it is good sounding, so that's that's a plus, at least. Um, and we did the adagio from number ten, which is. Perfectly fine. Nice and adagio number 10. And then there are live recordings. And the live recordings are where the fun really is. First of all, there's a live Mahler 5, which is like 10 times more intense than his studio one. And there's a live Mahler 6, which in spite of the cracking trumpets, which they do quite embarrassingly in a couple of spots, is just is just really intense. Oh my goodness, he really milks the climaxes, his great extremes of tempo, and it, it's, it's so powerful, and it's, oh, it's wonderful. It's a real, it's an event. Mahler should be an event. Tenstedt understood that. He didn't always create an event under studio conditions, but he created it whenever he could, and yes, um, even though he's not always successful at doing the event thing when he is, it's 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 amazing. And there's also a Mahler seventh, which is really quite a bit like sluggish um compared to his studio one, I think. But it is more of an event. It's certainly better. It's got more going for it. There's more stuff happening in it. It he pays listening a little bit better. So that, my friends, is the Tensch at Mahler box. And it's it's, you know, like I said, there it has its pluses and minuses, it's ups and downs, but the great stuff is absolutely fantastic. And and he was a very serious Mahler guy. Uh, he deserves he deserves respect. There's a lot of very powerful music making here. And if he was one of those guys who blew hot and cold, at least we got the hot stuff. And that's saying a lot. I would rather have someone who's hot and then cold than somebody who is just tepid. Because tepid Mahler is bad Mahler.
So there you go. Anyway, you might give this a shot if you want to. It's around. It's not expensive. What the heck? Have some fun with it. Keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.